Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's take a closer look at the missions of Mariner 6 and 7, the details of what they had on board, what kind of equipment they had on board, and what they were able to accomplish during those missions. Notice that they left about a month apart. Uh, considering that we have February there, 1969, so it's a 28-day month, that means there were 30 days between their launch dates. Mariner 7 was launched 30 days after Mariner 6. Now, it turns out that they arrived at about the same time. Mariner 7 arrived about three days after Mariner 6 because it took a lot less time for Mariner 7 to reach Mars. And that has to do with exactly when you launch the spacecraft and where the position of the Earth and Mars are. So in this case, just leaving 30 days later meant the trip was almost 30 days shorter. Now, when Mariner 6 arrived, it was able to take 24 pictures uh, covering about 20% of the surface, but they mainly went across the equator down to the South Pole, so most of the pictures were taken of the southern portion of March, which looks a lot more like the moon. It's a lot more rugged, there's all kinds of highlands and mountains and so forth, but what they did miss was the main the main features of the planet, they missed the large plate volcanoes and they missed Val Marinera. So at that point, they did not yet know that Mars had the largest volcanoes in the solar system and the largest canyon in the solar system. So that was missed, not known yet at the time, but they did start getting a feel for the, what the terrain was like, at least in the southern hemisphere of the planet. When uh, Mariner 7 came along, they took additional pictures, and the total number of pictures taken with the two missions was 201 total pictures. Now, in order to do that, we had a payload of 411.8 kilograms, about 908 pounds, so that would be less than half the mass of a small sedan, so it wasn't very big, and most of that mass goes to the fuel, goes to the structure of the carriage of the, of the spacecraft, and it was only allotted of 57.6 kilograms, which is 127 pounds, for all the instrumentation on board of the spacecraft. Now, of course, different companies would be producing those individual pieces of equipment, and everyone is given a certain amount of maximum mass they can use or weight that they can have in their equipment and the maximum power usage. So typically, they're constrained by the amount of power they can use and by the amount of weight you can put on the spacecraft, otherwise you couldn't get it off the ground. So, in order to provide the power, they had 17,472 photovoltaic cells. They're just what we, the solar cells as we call them today. And notice that they covered a total area of 7.7 .7 square meters to provide 449 watts of power where Mars is located. Now, the same cells, the same photovoltaic cells at the Earth's radius or at the distance from the Sun where the Earth is at will give you about 800 watts. So you're down to a little bit more than half the power by the time you reach Mars. Now, the minimum power required for maximum consumption is 380 watts. So they were somewhat above that number. So if everything went well, no problems with the solar panels, they would be able to provide sufficient amount of power. Now, of course, there's going to be some moments where perhaps the spacecraft gets in behind Mars, is occulted by, by Mars, and doesn't get any sunlight, so you have to have a backup power system. And to give the backup power system, they have a 1200 watt a 1200 watt hour battery uh, using silver and zinc uh, in their acid. Notice 1200 watts is a little bit more than three times this number, which means they had enough power and backup in the batteries to last for three hours in case the power went down. So in case they're occulted by, by the planet, they could still continue to operate. Now, what was included in all the instruments? Well, it turns out they had what we call an infrared radiometer to study the atmosphere, so to get a feel of what the components of the atmosphere were, and they discovered that the atmosphere was mostly made out of carbon dioxide. They did detect some trace amounts of water on the surface, which is interesting. Those instruments were sensitive enough to realize there was some water on the surface. Now, infrared, I think I'm missing a D right here, they had an infrared spectrometer, so that's a spectrometer that's able to distinguish between the various uh, wavelengths of infrared radiation that they could measure. They had a dual channel infrared radiometer to measure the surface temperature. 
They had a UV spectrometer, so it was able to detect UV light, and they're able to measure atmospheric interactions. Now, of course, that UV light would be coming from the sun, and how that UV light interacts with the atmosphere can also give them some idea of what the components of the atmosphere are using UV spectrometer, because UV light will typically get the electrons in the orbit of the, of the atoms in the atmosphere to jump up to higher levels. When they jump back down, they give off specific frequencies and wavelengths that can be studied. We have an, they had an S-band occultation. Uh, with other words, they were able to uh, figure out what was going on in the atmosphere when they were occulted by Mars. So when there's no sunlight received, they're in the dark side of, of Mars, so to speak, they're able to use the S-band occultation instrument to study the atmosphere during that period of time. They had a thermal control flux monitor to measure the temperature. They had, obviously, some cameras, a television camera. They were able to take all the pictures. And they also did some study of celestial mechanics, the motion of the planets, and the general relativity experiment, which was really interesting. So here, what they figured was that they could send signals to the spacecraft, get the signals back, and at times, uh, the signal would be, could be affected by passing by the planet and wanted to see if that had some sort of effect. Now, this was not as successful as the later studies on general rel relativity that was done when we had orbiters going around the planet, because in that case, and also landers on the planet, which, which we, with which we could communicate in such a way that sometimes the signals would pass the sun, a much stronger gravitational field would then cause much more effect that could be measured, therefore proving the theory of general relativity. So notice that the spacecraft also had to be attitude stabilized. You had to be able to control the positioning, the attitude of the spacecraft. And to do that, you need to know where you are. And so to do that, they were able to keep track of the sun and they were able to keep track of the star Canopus. Canopus is the brightest star in the southern hemisphere. It has an absolute magnitude, or no, not an absolute magnitude, but it has a, um, a pair magnitude of minus 0.7, so just behind uh, Sirius, and it's in the constellation Carina. It's, uh, like I said, the second brightest star in the sky. It has spectral type A9. It's about 10,000 10, times as bright as the sun, so it's kind of like a subgiant. And keeping track of the location of that star and location of the sun, they're able to figure out exactly where the spacecraft is and how to orient itself. So by the time it flew past the planet, they had all the instruments pointing in the right direction to make all the correct measurements. So it's quite amazing that back in 1969, they were able to pull all that together put on the spacecraft to send it out. Having all that instrumentation within the weight limit or the mass limit of 57.6 kilograms is quite a feat. Um, I'm kind of familiar with that because when I was an engineer working on radar systems, we were also given mass and power requirements for every module, for every component, and together we could not exceed a certain amount. And there was always this horse trading, well, I need a few more ounces here if you can give a few more ounces away here and that kind of thing to keep us uh, within the weight and power limits. So always kind of interesting as an engineer to try and hold yourself to those requirements so that brings back some good memories from the work I used to do. But yeah, I'm very impressed by the engineers that were able to put this together, get the spacecraft to Mars, and do all the measurements. Now, what happened also is that they arrived about a week after the Apollo landing. Of course, the entire world was focused on the landing of the, of the people on the moon, um, getting pictures from that. And so all this was happening in the background as they were trying to get ready for the uh, mission, for the flyby of the mission, and all this instrumentation and everything else. And, not a lot of people paid attention to this because the big story, of course, was the moon landing. So they kind of were in the shadow of this big event that happened just about a week before they arrived at Mars. But nevertheless, huge success, tremendous ability to learn from that ex experience. And of course, we then use that experience to then the next step would be to get a spacecraft in orbit around Mars and the next one to actually get something to land down on the surface, which later on we're able to do that. So this was a very good beginning to that end. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union, they also had the two spacecraft that went to Mars during that same time. They were much more um, adventurous in that they were actually trying to land some landers on the surface, but they weren't able to get out of the the orbit, the low Earth orbit, in order to get onto the trajectory to Mars, and those, so those two missions failed. 
Also notice that both the Soviet Union and the United States sent two missions roughly at the same time, one is sent a little bit after the other, because the expectation of failure is there, and so when you send two missions instead of one, at least if one succeeds, you get that experience. Unfortunately, if both do not succeed, then of course you have to go back to the drawing board. But that was 1969, some tremendous accomplishments, so let's keep going and see what else we discovered in our missions to Mars.